Welcome to Beyond Office Walls, the podcast where we explore the exciting world of remote work and its impact on our lives, careers, and the future of work. I'm your host, Dr. Elo, and in each episode, we'll dive deep into the remote work revolution, bringing insightful conversations with experts, remote work success stories, and practical tips to help you thrive in this new era of work. Whether you're a seasoned remote worker, just starting to remote work journey, or employer navigating the future of work, this podcast is for you. It's your go-to source for all things remote work. So grab your headphones, grab your favorite remote work spot, and let's embark on this exciting journey together. Welcome to Beyond Office Walls. In today's podcast, we have a very special guest, Tatiana Rodriguez, and she will be discussing with us the effective strategies for engaging students and remote teaching. Hola, Tatiana, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, or is it ELO? I was never quite sure if I should say hello or ELO. It's hello, hello, ELO. I'm, it's kind hello, of confusing hello, sometimes, ELO. but yeah. <laughs> and is it is it a combination of your name? Is it put it is. your name put together? It's, That's what I was a, thinking. It's like JLO, but less, less, less hotter, right? <laughs> All right, so if you're ELO, I would be T-Ro, right? I'm T-Ro, you're ELO. T-Ro, I like Got that. it. Got that it. is pretty cool. <laughs> all right, so Tatiana, welcome to the podcast. And we're going to start, first of all, by five questions that I have for you. The first one is, who is Tatiana Rodriguez? We have a bunch yes. of questions in there. So of how can you educate, create a sense of connection? We got what are some innovative methods? We got a bunch of questions in here that you can see in the screen. And we're going to ask that to Tatiana. But first of all, who is Tatiana Rodriguez? Yes, let's get deep. She's this really cool chick who loves to cook, teach, and dance around. <laughs> no, but, but you know, I, I would say one of the things that comes to mind right away is that I am an educator as an adjunct professor at a university. I think that's certainly something that I identify with. And I know we very often will talk about what we do when you ask who we are, but obviously we're all multifaceted. We're more like diamonds than anything else with so many different angles, but teaching certainly is one of those areas that's big for me. And, and I think that's the reason why you asked me to come and, and chat with you today. But in addition to that, I'm a, I'm a daughter, I'm a partner, I'm a sister, I'm an aunt, I'm a friend, I'm a contributor to this crazy online content creation world. So I think there's so many ways to answer that, but, you know, deep down in my heart, you know, who am I? Gosh, one of a kind, a one of a kind educator who I think loves to encourage others. And just like everybody else is, is trying to figure a lot of things out along, along the way. So not a very straightforward answer, but I think as human beings, we're just also multifaceted that it involves so many things like how do you answer this question, Ela? Like, who are you? I know, right? So um, I'm also, uh, I'm not an educator, but I am, you know, um, mm, I'm not a mm -hmm. professor or I'm not, I don't work in the, in the education industry, but I do educate uh, a bunch of people in my industry. So I work for the Maritime Administration, which is uh, uh -huh. from the Department of Transportation. So it's a federal office. That's what I do on a normal basis. But I'm also a father, very proud father of a nine-year-old called Franco. I'm a very proud husband, nice. uh, Rosemary, right? Rodriguez, she's a Rodriguez. Oh, so, hey, yeah. another Rodriguez That's in the house. Thing. Hello, Rosemary. <laughs> and I'm a son. Other than that, I'm also a content creator on the side, which I do this podcast. I do live streaming sometimes, and uh, I do a lot of tech reviews. That's what I actually like to do. So it's pretty cool. Very cool. And I'm sure people listening feel the same way and can even think about adjectives for themselves and yeah. the different facets of their own personalities, identities, because, you know, we didn't even really get into like weird things about ourselves or, you know, top three little known facts, but oh, it's yet. always interesting to learn deeper about each. Oh, okay. It's coming. It's coming. Let, <laughs> let, let me stop spoiling <laughs> it. It's coming. <laughs> There's no words here. No, word. no I'm joking. There's no <laughs> Thank you for accepting to come to this podcast. This podcast basically talk about uh, remote work and its intricacies, right? So I wanted to know your perspective as a professor 
of how do you manage that? And I have four questions because we already went to who are you? Who is Tatiana Rodriguez? And I have four more questions for you so you can demonstrate and tell us what what is important to you, right, in the in this spectrum. Let's go over the questions better. There are loaded questions. I'm sorry. That's why I sent them out first because I always, I always do loaded questions for some reason. That's what I've been told. How can educators create a sense of connection and engagement with students in remote teaching environments, especially when face-to-face -face interactions are limited? Yes, because the key thing we're going to focus on here is we are going to focus specifically in the remote world. And I came up with, when, when I saw your question, I was thinking about my answers. I realized that we can use a mnemonic here, the word nice, but it's got two eyes in it. So it's like nice, nice, right? Nice. And I would say that I am a nice person. I'm a kind person. And, and I, that extends into my classrooms as well. So I was thinking, what is it that I do that helps my students? Because the feedback consistently from them is that they do feel connected and engaged and seen in the class. So I was thinking, what do I do? I, I notice, I notice when they say things, I notice things in their, in their world. Like if they bring in a certain food and that food looks good to me, you know, I notice these things. So just noticing things about individual people or noticing things about the time of the semester, for example, Hey, I know it's midterm season. How's everybody's workload this week? You know, do you have tough schedules? Do you have exams? Do you have projects? Just so just noticing is the first one that awareness. Factor. And then say that again, that awareness factor, which is great. Yes, right. So noticing we're having that awareness factor. And then the the I the first I is for inquiring or inquiry, which means then I ask questions because it's one thing to notice it's another thing to say something. So I will inquire make sure that I'm asking a lot of questions because, you know, genuinely interested in, in what's going on. And the second is include people. So the opposite of excluding others. So I'm very conscious to make sure that I am creating an environment in the classroom where the students feel comfortable wherever they come from, whatever year they're in, whatever major they're in, whatever whatever's happening in their lives, working to create a sense of belonging, a sense of inclusion, a sense of acceptance for who they are right then and there in the classroom. So then that's the second I, and then the C really stands for caring. Like you have to care. I think everybody who's ever had a teacher that was good to them will say, and this could be in high school, this could be in college, this could be in elementary school, this could be a coach, this could be an instructor, you know, anybody in your life, you know the difference when somebody cares about what they're doing and when they don't. And you certainly know the difference when somebody cares about their students or they don't. And so caring, which comes naturally to me, and I think to so many people as educators who actually care and and I do and I feel like that comes across clearly and then the e the last part of this nice mnemonic here is that then I express those things to them right it's it's not just the feeling it's not just the thought it's not just the intention but I communicate my values to them I set up agreements with them as a class and expectations and and let them know so expressing expressing myself so that not only is the content clear, but also the culture that we're going to have in the classroom. So those are the ways like, when I really sit and think about it, you know, noticing individuals and individual things about people in the classroom, inquiring, including them, caring, and then expressing all of those things to them, I think are fabulous ways to approach developing connection and engagement in the classroom to to build that feeling where people feel comfortable where they feel included where they can feel connected when they can start to form relationships in the class because 
my goal every semester is that when we're together, that students enjoy that time and that space and that they learn. So my, my, my philosophy around classes is that they need to be meaningful. They need to be active, right? Interactive. And we'll talk a lot when we talk, discuss more specific techniques and things, but that there's a lot of active learning, that there's technology enriching the classroom experience. Cause I love technology and I think that it can be so fun and so helpful. And then that it be enjoyable. Like I was saying before, you know, that people really are having fun, feel like they belong there and that we're building that, that sense of community. So I think those are the, the foundational pieces that I put into place in my college classrooms. That is amazing. That's a, you sound like an amazing professor because um, <laughs> Thank back you. in the day, you know, there was, uh, when I went to college, right? Uh, when I went and got my, probably when I was in bachelor's degree, uh, getting my bachelor's, um, it was hard, like, uh, um, mm -hmm. at least in Puerto Rico, you know, um, there's colleges that were known for having some tough professors, like tough, like, uh, all right, you didn't learn anything from this class? Well, you can leave, so, you know, stuff like that. And now yeah, I think that different doesn't attitude. Work. Yeah, that doesn't work. And there are still people like that, unfortunately, and you know, I don't, I don't know what the value of that is in education, but I can tell you that I do hear my students talking about professors like that. And I just don't feel that we need to approach education that way. We don't approach high school that way. We don't approach elementary school that way. I'm not sure at what point it was okay to accept such a subpar experience in college now of course i i'm not saying everyone's style is the same right just as we have vast personalities we're going to have vast professors and i can learn even if we look at, at people in our community elo in the ecamp community right i'm learning i'm learning from doc doc rock i'm learning from adrian salisbury i'm learning from anna and fulgens i'm learning from alec johnson i'm learning from so many different people and everybody's style is different. But you can tell that people's hearts are in this, right? That they want to educate, they want you to learn, they want you to grow, even if it's different. So that attitude that you experience, I mean, that's, that's really unfortunate. And, and I, I am hoping that there will be an education revolution in college. And I think that it's already happening because the doors, the international doors of the world have opened up with the internet and people have a lot more choice when it comes to how they receive their education. And when people have a lot of options, then I think that that makes for a better experience for people as well. Yeah. That, that IV mentality that I have to go here, all that pressure, I think all that pressure is off already, uh, especially uh, when, when university started um, accepting students without uh, taking this tough test, right? Uh, this entry test or whatever for the, or other, um, what was the, the TOEFL was for me, right? Because I'm Latino, so I took the TOEFL. Um, and other tests like that, like the College Board of Puerto Rico or anything, those tests, um, mm. they started like taking those tests out and, and just bringing people in and having conversations and, and accepting them as, all right, you have capabilities, you have good grades, um, you have a good demeanor, let's go. You can start the program. So, so it's different. Elo, is your education in higher ed in Puerto Rico in English or in Spanish or both? Um, no, my education was uh, in first. I started in Dayton, Ohio, on well, university, right? Um, and then I went, came back to Puerto Rico, was in Spanish. Then I completed my master's in Chicago, and then I completed my doctor's in. Colorado. So er, er, the rest was in English, but I was well diverse mm. in English already because the first uh, six years of my life, I went to a, a to an all English uh, school, right? So it was a, a private school. I went to private school all my whole life, which I was very blessed uh, thanks to my parents. So I had a very good base of English so I can go, I can go back and forth in, in between it. So cool. 
Wow. Yes. So you really have, you know, an international, I know that Puerto Rico is not considered international, but it, it well, is, it's, it it's is. a different culture. It's a different language. So I think that that gives you an international perspective. Also many different States, right. Where you received education too. It was crazy. Colorado, was crazy. Ohio. Yeah. And it was different everywhere. And I need to adapt plus um, the Coast Guard experience too, as well. I was active duty for 10 years. So I traveled wow. with them too. So it's very, very diverse. And it helped me out as a professional, as a, as a person, first of all. That's pretty cool. And, and, you, and you know what you're reminding me of too, is that every educator, whether your title is an adjunct professor like me mm -hmm. or a different type of professor, or you're a leader in your organization, it's always about putting yourself and being able to take the perspective of the people that you're serving. So in my case, I'm serving my college students. So I need to take the posture of a learner, right? And I do, and I take classes and I, and I remind myself, yes, this is what it's like to have due dates when you've got all this other stuff going on in life and, and projects and teamwork and this and that and the other thing, because it really matters when you can put yourself in the other person's shoes. So whether it is in a formal classroom setting with adults or other people, or you're a trainer or a facilitator or a team leader or a manager or the president, being able to do that perspective taking and remember what it's like to be on the other side of things makes for a better experience for you because you have more empathy, more understanding, but it's also just makes you more real and therefore more connected to what's really going on than just being the person who, who says what needs to happen next and have that authority. People take it seriously when, when, and they notice when you have that different attitude, which is great. I agree. I agree. I love that. So, all right. So let's jump into the next question. So what are some innovative methods or technologies that have proven effective in keeping students motivated and actively participating in online classes? Now, first I have this little bit of a disclaimer, Elo, and that is that in person, right? This, what, what we call face to face is not the same as screen to screen. It, it's just not the same, right? We don't, we don't have it, dimensionally it's it's not the same right we have these these rectangle spaces when we're on whereas in person we have the whole body we have a three-dimensional person in front of us but even though they're different they're still real right some people may or may not agree with me but for me my online classes are still live so people are still there in real time and that is different if the classes were asynchronous meaning they're pre-recorded and people do it at their own pace, which has its value and its place as well. But in my experience, teaching it's live, it's interactive. Therefore there are people who are there. So it's still real screen to screen is still very real. There are still people showing up with you all at the same time. So just wanted to lay some of that groundwork and it is not easy to keep people engaged in a classroom when they're right in front of me, much less when they're looking at their screens and their cell phones and I can't see any of that stuff. So we just need to acknowledge, first of all, that the task is much greater. It is so much more challenging to keep people's attention online, which is why I think breaks is one of the most innovative things we can do and letting people know when those breaks are. So my students know that between this time and this time we have a 10 minute break, go and do your thing. And of course they also have the freedom if they need a break before that they just take it. But being considerate of the breaks that are needed to disconnect from a screen, I think is, is a, I wouldn't put it in the innovative, but more in the essential category that people often overlook when it comes to remote environments. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention is breaks. The second thing are things like games, right? It's really, really important to do things. So I wanted to show you one of the ways that I will incorporate interactivity. Let me just get the, the right screen loaded here. So, you, so you're seeing on my screen, it's, it's a website called flippity.net. So this is, if you go to that website, this is what the website will look like. And there are a bunch of games. So please feel free to check it out. It's flippity.net, F-L-I-P-P-I-T 
T-Y dot net. And so if you're, if you're able to watch this on YouTube, you're following with me on the screen. If not, I'll be sure to, to guide you with my voice if you're in listen only mode podcast style so that you, you feel like I'm still talking to you here. So flippity.net is a great website with tons and tons of cool game options that are all links. So you can create your thing. So one of the, one of the ones that I use is a, a, a randomizer. They have one called a randomizer and I created this board here. So in my public speaking class, I will give my students a line, a real line from a past student's speech, right? And then I will, the, here's the randomizing part. I just click this button. They get their next line. Boom. This person that their line is everyone should give themselves a chance to fail. And then you see three randomizers here of emojis. So I spin all three and the task is for them to say that line using a tone that is descriptive of the emoji next to it. So Elo, for example, if you were my student in my class and you got this line, we would be doing a lesson on 3D speaking, which is including not just the words, but also the tone and body language. So I would ask you to give this line in an angelic tone because we got the angel emoji first. The second one is like the teary eyed one about to cry. And the third one is the emoji with stars in their eyes. So starry eyed. So you would, and of course everybody laughs and feels a little awkward and uncomfortable, but it's low stakes. It's fun. I make sure students know the feeling that we're going for here and, and also building in improv exercises like this, where they don't have time to prepare is part of helping everyone get loose and comfortable with each other. So uh, do you want, do you want, do, do you want to give it a try? Yeah. All right. So let's go with number one with this angelical, right? Uh huh. So I can do angelical. <laughs> I'm cheating. Oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> Oh be. man, that's so good. That is so talk about a tool to be online engaging is being able to change your voice like that is super engaging. I need to up my game now. <laughs> you know, do a little bit of, um, let me see here. Like, uh, I feel so sad. Oh my God. <laughs> and then I'll man, you're feel... rocking this activity. <laughs> and I'll do like, this is a special announcement. I am so happy, guys. Oh, my God. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Fabulous. Right. So you really incorporated the vocal variety, the principles we talk about in class. So this is something that I, a tool I love to use. And this, I have to give credit to my friend, Joe, who's also a professor of public speaking. And he, he, he works as an, as an, as a instructional designer over at Montclair, but is also an adjunct professor of public speaking at Rutgers. And he told me about this like word emoji trend that was happening on TikTok. And so we, we found flippity and just decided to bring that classroom, that game into the classroom too, which is super, super fun. This is so this is thinking really about, amazing. wow. So fun. You, you like that? Tell me what you like about it. Oh, I like that. You can actually go get the personality of the person, right? Just, just, have that person come alive like if it was in person you know that's that's basically what i see like like you can actually have people that don't speak speak and and have them shine a little bit i get to know them a little bit via via doing that i, I don't know yes it, it works and an, an important consideration to make here is that there will be some students, Elo, who are so happy with this. Like they are totally excited to do this. And then there will be those who will be mortified. So I don't do this on the first day of class, right? I want people to, but I do tell them what's coming. I do my duty on the first day of class. I tell them my obligation is to let you know what you're getting yourself into with me as a student in this class so that you can decide if this is for you or not. And I'll always say, you know, I hope that you stay, you know, but I understand if you don't, but as long as I'm being fully transparent and honest so that you can make a good decision for yourself, because there's still time to add drop in the beginning of the semester, but I want them to know if they stay with me, 
the expectation is that they will participate, that they will engage, they will be asked to do things that make them uncomfortable, but never to a point of pain, right? I want to stretch them. I don't want to break them. But I, I also promise them a good time, a fun, growth. Their skills are going to go up way more than they ever thought possible. So gamifying things is one way to do that. But I'm also considerate that if a person seems like they're struggling a little bit, you know, I, I will help them out or I'll say, anybody want to lend a hand? Anybody have a good way to do the, the let's, one of the emojis is the frog one. Anybody, I'll be like, anybody have a, a better way to do the frog? Or I'll, I'll just reiterate, there is no right or wrong way to do this. The goal here is just to practice changing your tone up. So also making it, also helping out, but most of the time people have fun, but every now and again, you can tell someone's like, oh my God, I just want to crawl into a hole and die. So I try to help them feel a little less awkward about that, but it's also part of their, their growing into yes. this. So that is one, one way. And, and again, flippity.net has so many cool things that, that you can check out and probably ones that people have heard of like Kahoot are things that I use in class as well to do, to do games. And that does require a paid membership to be able to have, but I've never met anybody that doesn't enjoy a good Kahoot trivia game from time to time. And the, the fact that it was created for a digital environment is just amazing. So there are tons of awesome tools like that. Then there are also things like Miro, which is an online whiteboard. I'm gonna share this screen over here. So Miro, let me sign in. And this is an online digital collaborative whiteboard tool. So there's, so there will be, for example, uh, one that I created about fear and confidence. So asks, I'll ask students to share and you make all kinds of things in here. So in this case, asking people to anonymously identify what's your top speaking fear. And then we'll do a lesson about fear versus excitement because they tend to manifest themselves very similarly. Like if I were to ask you, when you feel afraid, Elo, what happens in your body? What would you say? My hands start sweating. That's me. Okay. And sometimes people will also say they have an accelerated heart rate or they can, they can feel their heart beating in their chest or they start talking a little faster. They feel short of breath. And then I'll ask them, and what does excitement feel like in your body? Bugs in my stomach, to be honest. My stomach gets all kinds of, oh my God. So yeah. Yeah. And that's the same thing people fear when they feel when they fear, feel nervous as well. That's something that happens to me when I'm nervous or excited. So the idea is once we identify that actually fear, nervousness, and excitement have a similar manifestation in the body, we have a conversation about that and how we can transform that nervousness is it's energy, right? Our body's letting us know that something's really important to us. What we're about to do matters. So whiteboards can be used in an infinite number of ways. And if we had more time, we could go into, but I just wanted to mention Miro as one, but that, and this is a paid one, but there's also Google Jamboard. And this is a great way to get started in, in the whiteboard digital space. And this is free. Right. It's just Google Jamboard. You can just look it up. Easy for you to find. And so if we if I let me open up one here. So in this case, I I set up some of these templates ahead of time and I'll have a student puts their name in each one of the columns in small groups. And you can even make it so that if they go to a particular frame, like frame number one will be breakout room number one. So you give everybody the link, but if you're in breakout room one, you go to frame one, breakout room two goes to frame two, et cetera, et cetera. And you can have them answer questions in each sticky and give them prompts to be able to do that. So whiteboard activities with deliverables, meaning the students have an activity, the instructions are clear, you've gone over them, you release them into the breakout rooms, and then you give them something to do. 
they do it together as a team. And again, it has to be meaningful, relevant to the content and something that they can contribute to. So there are tons and tons of really great ways to use whiteboards, games, all kinds of things. And then in addition to that, there are things that I structure throughout the class that make the course itself very engaging. So for my public speaking class, I have my students create a podcast in teams of three. Next Monday coming up, as we come to the end of the semester, they're going to deliver a live stream show that is debate style where there's a host and two people on this side of the issue and two people on the opposite side of the issue. And they're debating that. And the theme is human beings versus artificial intelligence. Ooh, nerve wracking. <laughs> so For them. yes, yes. And, and, and there, so the activities, it's, it's an online activity. They're learning to frame themselves up on camera. They're learning about lighting. They're learning about voice. They're learning about presenting on screen. They're, they're learning how, uh, just the experience of going live. And I tell them all the time, use these things to build up your resume, to help you stand out in interviews. When people ask you what's something interesting that you've done or something unique about you or experience related to communication, everybody's looking for strong communication skills and their candidates to be able to say, I participated in a live stream in an online live stream. And this was my role. This is what I did. So just finding creative ways where the assignments in the course are in and of themselves engaging, but they don't always have to be digital and high tech. Sometimes you can do something like asking someone to grab an object that's meaningful to them. And then you can do some prompts with that. You know, so grab something in your environment. Like for me, this is something that's near me. So I grab this, make your mark on the world. And then you can do it in so many different ways. You can do it in small groups. You can have them just type in the chat. Like you got your, you got your object. Okay. We've got our objects here. And then, and certainly this is a way to get to know people in a, in a way that's meaningful because you grab something that has meaning to you. So Elo, if I asked you, what is the meaning of that object for you? What would you share? Well, for me, this object right here is just uh, a way to uh, calm my mind when I'm um, nervous. So I can take this out and just put it back together again. And it just helps me with the anxiety uh, of, of things. If I have a, like a tough day, I'll take a break and I'll take it apart, put it back. I have another one here, which is this little thing right here that I can just, you know, just put it here, put it apart, put it back in there. And just, you know, things that I use for whenever I'm, I'm nervous, whenever I'm, I'm overwhelmed because I get mm. overwhelmed with a lot of projects at the same time. So stuff like that just helps me calm down. Um, and while I'm thinking about stuff that I'm doing, it makes me rationalize and, and, and sometimes helps me with empathy, <laughs> to be mm. honest. Because uh, 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 some people don't have it, and I still need it. I work for the people. I work for the federal government. So I need to have empathy at all times. So, yeah, works out. Yeah, and the beautiful thing about you sharing just off the top of your head something like that, if you and I are students in this class, I get to hear you be a little bit vulnerable about things in your life. And if anxiety, if overwhelm, and if you're human, you have experienced this, right? It's then you hear like, okay, it's okay to mention that. And there are healthy strategies to go about that. And this is how he does it. Like it starts to create that sense of realness and that humanity piece to it as well. And then everybody shares their item and something meaningful to them. And you start to get to know people and that helps to establish more connection starts to build trust, right? One activity is not automatically going to create trust in a group, but it starts to lay down the foundation that, you know what? I remember Elo, he talked about anxiousness and nervousness and he had some good strategies. That might be something I have a conversation with him about one day or can, can chat about. Like it just, it just helps us feel more comfortable in our own skin and being able to have that, that sense of connectivity in our teams, in our spaces, and in my case, classrooms. That is really amazing. I love the way you, that you're you're providing a lot of value, man, to 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 
young adults, let's put it that way, right? So people that mm, are are, yes. are marking our future. So I love it. I love it. All right. So next can question. I show you two more? Or are we like course, ready to yeah. run no, out of time or we got to go? No, go for it. Okay. So I'm going to show you. There are game show type of things too. And this is something that I, I purchased these. You can do this in Ecamm. You can do this if you use a, a free software like OBS as well, but you do need to have special software to run things like this. If you're going to, to run a trivia game, for example. So I was, I was a guest on my friend's show. I had this question. So this is when it's all, when it's all set up, but let's just say content for my class. I, I talk about this concept, the duck bunny. So uh, as a trivia question, when was the duck bunny created? I don't really care that they know the year. I really just want a, a chance to reiterate about the concept, but it's to, we love to answer questions. So I'll ask them what year was the duck bunny created? Is it A, 1897? Is it B, 19, 1927? C, 1987? Or D, 2007? And then C. people, you think it's C? And let's find out what the correct answer is. It's actually A, wow. 1897. So this is a very old concept. And then from there, I'll, I'll say, can someone reiterate the concept of the duck bunny, right? So my goal is just to get people interested by asking the question, get the brain curious by asking the question, but really to go over, really to go over the concept, right? And then similarly, I'll ask, you know, what do we call that moment that people decide to change because they are emotionally invested? Is it A, the emotional commitment point, B, the emotional effect point, C, the emotional intelligence point, or D, the emotional inflection point? Everybody type it in the chat. Let me know what you think. And if you are listening to this right now, take a guess. Do you think it's A, B, C, or D? Elo, what's your answer? Well, invested is commitment, so I'll go with A. You're going to go with A and Even though the I'm correct, thinking C, but yeah. <laughs> and the correct answer is D, the emotional inflection point. Bum, 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 bum. <clears throat> so it's a concept we would have exactly, but even, even if people get it wrong, it doesn't matter. Right? We get a chance to talk about the concept and then I can, I can show the, the, the emotional inflection point diagram. We can talk about this. And then even simpler, let's do some true or false trivia. Which one is true? Ethos is about reputation or pathos is about speaker's emotions. Which one do you think is true? Which one do you think is false? Two is true. You think two is true. And so then you think A is false, Might as right? Well. But it is in fact- The opposite. The opposite. <laughs> It is in fact the opposite. It is in fact, ethos is about the reputation of the speaker. There are no like and trust factors mm -hmm. and pathos is about the emotions that we elicit from our audience. So it's not necessarily about how the person is feeling, but how they express themselves and help their audience feel things through the delivery of the speech. So again, regardless of whether people get it right or wrong, we get a chance to talk about the concept in a fun way. One thing I will say when you do this is you have to build in the time for it, right? Because if you're just going to go question, answer, question, answer, that's faster. But if you want to talk about it, then you have to make sure that you're building in those time frames. And then last question, on average, what percentage of your content do people tend to remember on average? Is it A, 60%, B, 45%, C, 25%, or D, 10%. What does everybody think? Guess it in your mind, guess it out loud, whatever you like, but what percentage on average do you think people remember? Let's put it this way. What percentage of what Elo and I have said today will you remember after listening to this episode? Well, if I am, uh, after this amazing episode, it's 90%, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, the correct answer is D. I kind of Neuroscience suspect. shows that we, now it does depend, right? But it does depend. Sometimes it's more than 10, sometimes it's less than 10. But on average, we're only taking away about 10% of what we're hearing from others, which means 
Since my students are human and I'm human too, this happens to me, they're only taking away about 10%. And the goal is, this is the research according to Dr. Carmen Simon, are we making it so that people are remembering the 10% we want them to take away? Or are we just letting it be totally random? So this is something that really stuck with me and is a powerful tool that I teach my students because it applies to all of us when we're teaching, when we're training, that in general, people are only going to take away a small percentage. So what increases the chances that they're going to remember? If it's fun, if it's engaging, if they participate, which is why learning in an interactive style is my favorite way. And this is what I love to teach and help others incorporate into their content as well is this interactive, active learning style, engaging strategies to be able to achieve that. So these are just some, some examples of ways that we can engage, engage people with trivia and questions and getting that brain curiosity flowing. No, I love it. I love it. This is really amazing. Especially, um, I think it would be higher, but that's just me thinking. If I will remember more if there's visuals like this, right? The things that you're doing, I think, uh, uh, I don't know, for some reason, it's, they stick more than just listening. So if you're right. listening to this podcast, you should go and watch it so you remember more. <laughs> Absolutely. Come check us out. At least get curious and you can see like, oh, what do these people look like? <laughs> I know, right? What do these what do these questions she's talking about look like? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next question, we got two more. In what ways can remote teaching be personalized to cater to individual learning styles and preferences, enhancing student engagement and understanding? In some ways, we've talked about it when when we're we're, uh, we're sharing like thinking about who your audience is. So thinking about my particular group of students, they're college students. Not so helpful if everything that I show them really caters to 46 year old women like me, right? I've got to create content supporting materials that are relevant to their age group. And that means I need to ask like, and find out more about their lives and things. So it makes a little more sense to use musicians that they're familiar with and excited about than only talking about the ones that I'm excited about. So I think personalizing it to the audience as a group while also adding little personal elements throughout. So for example, if there was something memorable that happened in one of my classes in a subsequent class, I'll mention that and having the opportunities to link things from one moment together, another moment together really adds for personal experience. I also include things in the class images. So when my students all deliver their, their speeches, I'll get us a, a snapshot. I'm constantly recording and taking pictures throughout class as well. That's uh, meant for us to use in the class. And if I ever post anything, I always double check and get permission from my students or they know that I'm taking a photo or something to be shared on social media but I will make it personal because they're seeing themselves. And there's, there's that old book that's still a classic, how to, how to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie that I believe the first edition was written in the late 20s, early 30s. And one of the things, one of the concepts from that is that everybody loves to hear the sound of their name. And not for selfish vanity reasons, but because it's direct and it's personal. So I bring in tent cards, dry erase tent cards on the first day of class when they're in person. So this is an in-person tip to help everybody know that there's a name. Now it's very easy to do this when we're online, say on Zoom, because our names are built right in, right? We don't have to remember the name, grab the name. It's right there. So in an online space, it's just about remembering to use a person's name, speaking to them and saying, Elo, what do you think? You know, Jacob, what are your thoughts? Suhail, I'm curious, what do you think? Saeed, let me know what's on your mind. I'd love to hear from you. And then next up, we're going to go to Adrian. And next up, we're going to go to Jenna. Just using people's names is a very powerful way to personalize the content. And going back to the first question, noticing 
asking questions, expressing yourself makes for a personal experience too. Then also having, allowing for some choice, you know, in, in a classroom, there's certain criteria that I'm required to present to the class. Like we have to do these assignments. It's just part of the curriculum. Every professor who teaches this course needs to do similar things, but allowing the students to have choice. So for example, for their persuasive speech, they can talk about anything they want to, anything at all, as long as it's something they care about and can get energized to speak about. So I think offering choice in situation in situations like this really helps to make it personalized and more engaging because people have a say in it, right? It's not just something that they're being told to do. They have a matter of choice in it too. So adding choice, I think is, is really important. The, the other part that I keep in mind when I'm teaching is that everyone has different energy levels, personality styles, temperaments, histories, everything. So Elo, are you an more introverted person or a more extroverted person when it comes to energy levels and group dynamics? You can tell that I'm really extroverted. But You're an extrovert. What? All the time. <laughs> okay. So for you, interactivity is probably fairly easy. You know, for you, you're one of those people who's like, sure, you need oh, somebody yeah. to help? I'll help. No problem. Like, that's exciting. Not everybody feels that way. Right. And that's not right or wrong. It's just a different level of energy. So because of, because of my classes being so interactive and engaging, I want to make sure students know, Hey, if you're an extrovert, this is probably going to feel great to you. You're going to be more energized by this class. If you're an introvert, I promise you're still going to enjoy this and grow, but I want you to know that there is a high level of interactivity so that you know to recharge your batteries. But I also promise that there will be activities that are not always going to be about group dynamic and high energy exchange. There will be moments to reflect, time to think, time to process, quieter activities as well, so that at least they know that I'm being considerate of all those things. And we also talk about team dynamics, helping them get to know their own tendencies and personality styles and be able to put words to certain things. So if they're on a team project, find out, are you more of a procrastinator? Are you more of a pre-planner? And how much of a pre-planner are you? And making agreements as a team that, hey, if we agree to do this, but somebody doesn't, what do we do next? So I'm just helping them have those conflict resolution, clear communication, boundary setting, expectation discussion questions as a group to help create a very personalized experience for them. So. There's so much more, but the last one I want to touch on is that I think we also need to do is create opportunities for them to lead as well. Like it shouldn't just be all about the person who is the leader. So in my case, myself as the professor, I'm at the helm, right? Like I'm the pilot of that class, but it doesn't mean that I'm the only one that can be in a position of leadership. So I create opportunities for them to shine as well for them to try out their skills. So I'll ask for an MC to, to debrief what they see going on in the chat. Two people help them play off each other, interact. When we're preparing for speeches, I'll ask, hey, does anybody have experience with a helpful meditation or some type of breath work that you can teach us? And I always have somebody who says yes and is and is willing to share that and if i ever didn't then i would be prepared to do it myself but just making making sure that we're creating opportunities for students to be in positions of leadership as well that's pretty amazing because you're basically working um working on those things that you need to be a successful uh, person outside in society no matter what yes. you do no matter what work you do you need to be sometimes an extrovert, sometimes an introvert, sometimes an ambivert. You need to For have sure. all those, all those, you know, all those things in you. And by practicing that, um, the way that you're doing it, it's really amazing. I love it. I really love it. Um, truthfully, I'm enjoying this a lot. So awesome. <laughs> Yay. Woohoo. <laughs> all right. So last question. Um, what role does teacher 
or professor training and professional development play in improving the effectiveness of remote teaching strategies to keep students engaged and learning effectively? Well, I think training, learning, being a student of life, a lifelong learner over here, I mean, it's going to help you. Learning as much as we can is always going to help us. My experience as an adjunct professor is that there is not a lot of training to help guide you. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to do on my platform is help guide, help give ideas, especially around active learning, engaging your students and creating dynamic classes that students love and remember. That's my tagline. So I feel like I'm trying to help fill a need that I see in the world right now with there being a lack of support for adjunct professors when it comes to education. But also at my university, there are departments that are there to help us, such as th there is a department with instructional designers that's called teaching and learning through technology. And they will work with professors to help them set up their content, set up their class. They usually have great ideas for, for how to set up the, the learning management system. So the, the program that will be the interface between students and professors and assignments. We also have uh, an, uh, an, an office of teaching evaluation and research that offers training and workshops. So 100% taking advantages of all the opportunities that your university offers or that other universities offer for free. I mean, when, when we all went to emergency remote teaching during COVID, there was a school of social work that offered free training to anybody. And I signed up for every single one of their things, right? I'm not in the school of social work. I don't, I'm not even in the same state as they were, but signing up and learning as much as you can. We of course have YouTube university as well with tons of stuff. Part, part of the content on YouTube that's there to help you learn for free is my content as well. So the role is, is huge and we just can't do it alone, right? So it's part of, Part of my mission is to help fill that gap, but I also wanted to share with you some things that I think will, will help you. And one of these people is a cognitive neuroscientist, Dr. Carmen Simon. She's on LinkedIn at Dr. Carmen Simon, but if you look her up, she's the one that I learned about the 10%. People are only going to remember about 10% of your content. She talks about how to make your presentations engaging and the science of memorability. She is fantastic. So absolutely check her out. Then there is a, as an educator, I love facilitators, right? Facilitators to me are awesome. I run my classes like workshops, like mini workshops within workshops. And Jan Keck, who is based in Germany, lived in Canada for a while. He's an introvert and I love taking his classes and working with him and learning from him because he reminds me how to make sure that I'm being inclusive of people of different energy levels. Cause like you, Elo, I am also an extrovert, oh, but, I <laughs> <laughs> but I want to make sure that, I mean, the, the classes are not about me. The class is about a great experience for my students. And that means all students of all energy levels. So making sure that, that I'm doing that. And he has, I mean, his visuals are just fantastic. He inspires me to the, the way that he creates his content. Another person is Chad Littlefield. He has free digital connection cards. You, you can purchase the physical ones and he has other content that you can purchase. And I purchased everything that he's put out, but he does have free ones called We Connect cards. So there's an activity to help you get to know a group with these questions that are meant to be a little bit deeper than just surface level. And I think Jan also has a deck of cards. So a lot of trainers, facilitators will have decks that are helpful. So he's another person that I love to follow his work as well. So you can follow all these people on YouTube as well. Somebody that I met recently who's really impressed me is Saeed Saduk, who is also based in Germany. He uses OBS, Miro, and he calls himself the facilitator so like a blend between a facilitator and an entertainer and he does a lot of super cool unique things that also inspire me as an educator and claudio senhauser who's a friend who's a colleague i've been on his show he his youtube website his his youtube channel is pitch coach so it's a youtube.com at pitch coach and he has two videos that i want to point your attention to one is 
cameo is, is for PowerPoint cameo, which is incorporating your live camera and PowerPoint and another one in keynote using your live camera, which is a really fun way to do things like I'm about to show you on the screen, but go to Claudio's YouTube channel, watch those two videos, the cameo video and the keynote video, and there'll be links to free downloads. You can download the PowerPoint template. You can download the keynote slide filled with things that you can use right away to be able to do things like this, right? To, to, to put yourself into your messaging on screen, online in a virtual space in ways that are a little bit different out of the norm that you can't help but pay attention to. Or let's say when, when I'm talking about distractions to my classroom, I'll do oh, this. Man. I love that Right. One. <laughs> so, so here I am talking to them about distractions in a way, and this gets their attention. 100% gets, gets their attention. So again, if you, if you check out Claudio stuff. He has free links to, I mean, I, I can't even remember how many slides he created to help everybody. So it's a lot. So I do encourage you to check that out. And then there are websites like sessionlab.com. They have a, a great library of content for all kinds of activities that will help you to in, in figuring out how to engage your group, stay connected. So there are just amazing resources. And then one more website that I want to share with you is from Dr. Barbie Honeycutt. She has a podcast called Lecture Breakers. So you can go to barbiehoneycutt.com or even lecturebreakers.com. And she, on the Lecture Breakers podcast, it's a place for college professors, instructors, and educators share innovative teaching strategies. I learned so much from her. I've been on her show twice talking about engagement. And, and one of the episodes we did was about having online camera presence as a professor. And this, the other one was about end of semester activities to engage your students. But she has so many fantastic episodes. So those are just some of the many resources that I wanted to to share educators to be able to, to up their engagement. Those are just some strategies that I wanted to share with you that will help you connect with your audience, whether it's a student or team or a group, but will really help you to up that, that connectivity, that engagement in an online environment. And there are many, many, many more, but these are just some of the ones that you can get started with. Wow. I'm blown away because there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know, which is amazing. For me, for me, it's it's enlightening because I'm thinking of a thousand ways of using what you provided, not only for anything related to teaching, right, in the university, but I can use it at work. Wow. For sure. It's really amazing. I yeah, appreciate I mean, everything that you have brought here. You have made it really interactive. I'm sure that your students are really happy with what you do. I am sure of it because Aww. we just had a class right now. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> a little taste, right? But absolutely. I, I hope that you felt connected and engaged and, and interested. And please do feel free to check out my YouTube channel, Tatiana Teaches. And that's where I'll be posting more and more content. And I've got what I'm calling the Adjunct Professor Academy that I'm going to run in January and July coming up in 2024. I plan to make it a biannual thing where it'll be a, a live interactive workshop where you can come and learn about active learning strategies, the, the process behind it, and then get yourself prepared for delivering your own instruction, your own courses, your own workshops, your own classes, and then having the opportunity to practice it too in a group of people that will be supportive and encouraging and creative. So feel free to check out my stuff for, for more information about that too. Amazing. Amazing. I'm, I'm super happy. I'm super pumped that uh, this podcast for me one of the best podcasts I've had. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying, I'm just saying, guys, whoever <laughs> wants to be in for, you need to up your game because this podcast is going to break the internet. So awesome. thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh man, I'm excited. I'm going to listen to this again while obviously while I edit and I'm going to take some notes, try to incorporate those things, those pieces of technology that you have and you provided. And obviously the tips nice as well so mm -hmm. all those tips yes. put them into practice <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to come in here to the podcast and uh yeah you have any last words before we depart just want to say what a pleasure it is to talk about one of my absolute favorite topics and i i want to highlight underscore 
that the most important thing above the technology, above any game, above any whiteboard, is to let the students know that you care and you're there to help them grow. And that comes across better, more clearly, more authentically than any technology tool we can possibly use. So while those things are gonna generate engagement and interest, the number one thing is that this needs to be a matter of heart for you and people will pick up on that and will want to be a part of that with you. That is amazing, Tatiana. And so I wanna personally thank you for being here, for accepting uh, to come into the podcast and uh, we will actually talk soon. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your day, Elo. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm wishing everybody listening fabulous remote sessions that are full of engagement, laughter, joy, and meaning. Thank you for having me. Of course. All right. And there you have it. This is one amazing podcast episode from oh, yay. <laughs> uh, navigating the remote work and revolution. And I want to thank every one of you. Um, this has been an amazing podcast and see you guys in the next one. Stock three.